Hi, your 11s and 12s. So this is now the second video in the protein structure and function PowerPoint. Um, last video, we looked at how transcription and translation actually go ahead and create a protein. How RNA splicing removes the introns, leaving only the exons, etc. This video, we're actually going to look at proteins themselves and the three different or four different structures that proteins can have and we refer to the proteins as. Um, so primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures of proteins. And then that'll be it for this PowerPoint. So let us begin. Like usual, there's no need to know for this second video. If you want to know the content that's covered from the stage to outline in this video, you need to go back to the first PowerPoint and it's on that second slide. Let's begin. So protein structure and function. As we talked about last week in the last video, the biological function of a protein is all determined by the structure. So how a protein acts all depends on the shape of that protein. And that's because every protein has a unique 3D shape. That shape is determined by the sequence of amino acids, which is determined by the sequence of nucleotide bases. That's why transcription and translation are important. And the actual structure of the protein can be described in four different ways. Primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary. And we're going to look at each of those in detail and how they come about. So the first one is the protein's primary structure. The primary structure is literally just the sequence of amino acids which make up the protein. So when we're talking about the primary structure of a protein, literally just what amino acids make up that protein. The primary structure obviously is based purely on what nucleotides are in the mRNA and consequently the gene inside the DNA. And every protein has its own unique primary structure and that primary structure will help determine the higher order structures like secondary, tertiary and quaternary. The secondary structure on the other hand is how the folding occurs with the polypeptide bonds due to hydrogen bonding between the peptide groups in that protein. There's two different types of secondary structure. You can have an alpha helix or a beta sheet. Generally, so over here we've got the alpha helix, so you can see the protein's more of a helical shape, whereas over here the beta sheets are almost like layers folded on top of each other. The alpha helix are the more common type of secondary structure, and the beta sheet is also very common. The folding that occurs is all based on the amino acids and the primary structure of the protein, because whatever amino acids are there, they're going to fold differently depending on how they want to bond with the other amino acids. So the secondary structure depends on the primary structure of the protein. We then have the tertiary structure, which is the 3D shape of the protein itself. And this, all, this third tertiary structure is all done by the attractive forces between the amino acid side chains. So these are the different molecules that are attached to the amino acids. The attractive forces, between, so those side chains we call R groups. Folding that occurs because of the attractive forces between those different R groups that helps us to determine the tertiary structure of the protein. The tertiary structure of the polypeptide molecule is going to be related to its biological function. So however this tertiary structure ends up and what active sites it creates will help us to determine how this protein is going to work. Okay. Those are the attractive forces that can occur between those R groups could be hydrogen bonding, covalent bonding, or hydrophobic interactions. Again, just summarizing, so we had the primary structure, which was the sequence of amino acids. That primary structure and the amino acids that were in the protein determined how they were going to be folded. So we had the alpha helix or the beta sheet. Whatever side chains were attached to those folded proteins and how they attracted to each other determined the overall 3D shape and hence the function of that protein. So the quaternary structure is when there's more than one polypeptide molecule making up a protein. So in this diagram over here, we have the red polypeptide molecule, dark blue polypeptide molecule, light blue polypeptide molecule, and a gray polypeptide molecule, all interacting with each other to form one protein. The arrangement of these polypeptide molecules is all going to be determined by the 3D shape in the tertiary structure, whether or not they're going to fit together. But this is how the quaternary structure is. So basically, multiple polypeptide molecules coming together to form a protein. Lastly, we're going to look at the different types of proteins that we have. So there's basically protein molecules can be described as one of two different shapes. They're either going to be fibrous or globular. 
a goblet of proteins are spherical in shape. Um, they're almost like, just as the name sounds or suggests, it's like a blob. Okay, They're very soluble in water. That's because their polypeptide chains are folded in a way that they're hydrophilic. Now, we haven't come across that term before. Hydrophilic Philic means love. Hydro water. Love water. The hydrophilic groups are all on the outside of the molecule, which means they're attracted to water and can actually be soluble in that water. On the other hand, fibrous proteins are very long and they have parallel polypeptide chains held together by really strong bonds. And they're not soluble in water because they're folded in a way that their hydrophilic groups are on the inside. The purpose of a fibrous protein is they give structure to cells and organisms. So we're thinking things like proteins that might be involved in the cell membrane, for example. They're helping giving structure to that cell or organism. They're also very, very strong due to the fact that they had those strong bonds.